the helmet that camera. Structure we as you see can see the, the structure, the tubes walker. you see outside the hatch, all of they call the, the Skywalker. Uh, an obvious reference to uh, the Star Wars films. And uh, this is the structure that's going to be used by the astronauts to maneuver outside the, the capsule. Now, it's interesting to note that when it comes to technology, this is close to what was done in the 60s, in fact, by the Russians and Americans, mm. when uh, there was no hatch system with a depressurization. So you had to empty uh, the vehicle they were in, so the, the capsule, and then walk out and then come back inside again and repressurize uh, the capsule. So this is very much what's happening here. Though it has never been attempted by a private company. It's a private mission. And, and given that, James, that this is, of course, SpaceX, which is owned by Elon Musk, X is owned by Elon Musk, Tesla is owned by Elon Musk, um, just how powerful is this man? Well, he is very powerful, and we are seeing it also in the you know, American election, where he's decided to back Donald Trump, which he's offering his services uh, to audit. Our oh, my God, that's amazing. Here. It is quite amazing. We see... Isaac, uh, Isaac, Jared Isaacman, Jared Isaacman stepping Isaacman. out of the capsule and seeing what must be an incredible view in real life, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, even after the training and stuff, the two years of training, I don't think anything can prepare you for this. No, quite clearly, it must be something quite incredible, especially if you consider that you know the training is done either in water, which is a, you know something we've always, we've all, I'd say, experienced floating in water, or being held up with a harness so that you, you know, you work without gravity in a sense. But it's not the same as actually being there, there, and having no gravity at all, and obviously realizing that if you, you know, if for some reason anything goes wrong. Um, it's basically over. Yeah. It's obviously, you know, they're flying at 25,000 kilometers per hour, 730 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, and stepping out of a vehicle in what is barely a suit, obviously a very high-tech suit, yeah. but it's still uh, quite impressive. Uh, from what I understand is they, the crew had done uh, over two years uh, of uh, training in preparation for this landmark mission, which includes uh, hundreds of hours in uh, simulators, as well as skydiving, centrifuge training, scuba diving, as well as uh, climate, uh, climbing a volcano over in Ecuador. So they have clearly put in the work, even though these are non uh, professional astronauts to be able to, to carry out a mission uh, like this and uh, we, he's still making his way out of that uh, capsule, um, Jared Isaacson. But it's actually, actually quite interesting to see the way he's moving on these pictures. This is where you realize, you know, you say non-professional, it's true, it's not their job, but still at this stage you could argue that they have you know, full training and preparation, that they're physically prepared to, to, to perform these tasks. Uh, I'd say, you know, I think maybe, non you know, you could say that they are astronauts, and maybe it's not their job, but you could argue that they are professional astronauts nevertheless, in the sense that they have all this preparation. But it's still interesting to realize that you'd have a little less preparation that you would have for or you would say professional astronauts. But once again, you know, Chris Isaacman is, has already been in space. Uh, he is a seasoned pilot and a jet pilot. Uh, and so, of course, he, he does have extensive experience when it comes to flying. And James, this, of course, is, is a mission by SpaceX, but are they working in conjunction with NASA f to carry out a mission like this? Do you now, they, they do work in conjunction with NASA simply because they use their facilities. For example, when you take the launch, uh, well, uh, it's being launched from, from a NASA facility. So obviously, uh, yes, it, they work together. Uh, Those are the four crew members there. Uh, you can see on your screen, Jared. Isaac Men, Scott uh, Potit, uh, Sarah Gillis, and Anna Menon. Uh, the, the two, um, Scott and Anna Menon, will be remaining inside uh, the, 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 the 
the capsule. In the capsule, exactly. And uh, while Jared Isaac Men, who is making his way out of the capsule, now to do that spacewalk, Jared and Sarah Gillis will be uh, conducting uh, some tests, I believe. Yeah, 38 uh, scientific uh, scientific tests will be performed during this uh, this this, uh, this extravehicular activity. Uh, 38 experiments now. Let's face it, this is not about science. This is about business and politics. It demonstrates what, because you were asking me about NASA. NASA is very happy to see this happen, simply because it validates their strategy of using private companies uh, in order to perform, I'd say, more simple tasks. Once again, this is very impressive, but they're not landing on the moon. They're not sending anything to Mars yet. It is still stuff that was done in the 60s by NASA. Hmm. So. Very impressive for a comp private company, uh, but still, you know, this is not cutting edge space uh, exploration. But it's interesting for NASA, who will be watching this, of course, to, because it validates the strategy of using private companies to do what NASA knows it can do. Also, obviously, it is a pretty strong message when it comes to uh, other private companies. I would cite Jeff Bezos, who must be watching this thinking, right, they have a, a certain lead. Uh, also, if you take, for example, the Chinese, the Indians also, who, you know, have a space program, uh, it does show that there is considerable, uh, there's a considerable lead when it comes to uh, the American private sector, uh, when it comes to space. So, yes, it is a technical tour de force. And it will validate the whole of the um, SpaceX process when it comes to this type of activity. But yes, it's not exactly, as I say, it's not exactly cutting edge either. Not cutting edge, but still historic. Uh, uh, let's talk about, um, uh, because this, I believe, is one of three missions between Isaacson and uh, SpaceX will be conducting, right? Yes, absolutely. But Isaac Man has signed on for three missions. Uh, these three missions, the first one is, is the one we're actually seeing right now. It's called Polaris Dawn. And Polaris Dawn is uh, this extravehicular activity. We have no specifics about Polaris 2. We know it will still be conducted with the same equipment. It'll be probably Crew Dragon. We don't know what the exact objective of Polaris 2 will be. Polaris 3, though, would be the maiden voyage of the Starship. Now, the Starship is this very large rocket that's been designed by SpaceX uh, that has an in remarkably interesting capacity. It's, it's so big, you can actually put 100 people in it. Uh, the point being, eventually, to use uh, the Starship that can land on another planet. Once again, for now, it is completely experimental. It hasn't really flown yet, or at least there would be no crewed flights. But once it actually works, the point of the Starship would be to take people uh, to Mars. Also, it's a very powerful uh, rocket, and it's one that has considerable range. That's the project. So it could send things to the under other end of our solar system fairly rapidly, or at least faster than any rocket we have at this stage. It could also be used, of course, to go to the moon. Now, this Starship manned mission will be a very important milestone uh, when it comes to uh, the possibilities of SpaceX and even, I'd say, space exploration as a whole um, in the years to come. But do we know why uh, the uh, Isaacman is not floating away as we typically did see back in, in the 60s when you said NASA, for instance, carried out uh, those historic firsts, uh, is it because of the of the what the, the suit they're wearing, or is it because they're attached to to that oxygen, as you mentioned? Well, they're attached, as as and actually we can see he's coming back in now. Uh, he yes, he he is attached to the spacecraft. This is not an autonomous uh, autonomous suit. Hmm. You remember, we all remember seeing these incredible pictures of the jet pack with the autonomous suit. Now those was, heavy little things yeah. on the back, so yes. Those are much heavier suits. Uh, they're much thicker. They have an integrated breathing system. Uh, they have an integrated pressure system. Uh, they are arguably much more complex than this type of suit. Even if you take the suits that were used in the, on the moon in 1969, hmm. they were autonomous. You saw Neil Armstrong step out of uh, the uh, Apollo capsule and walk on the moon and walk along. He had no tubes attached. Those were also suits that were, in a sense, more advanced than these. These are only, they're not autonomous, as you can see, there is an umbilical cord. Now, it does appear that 
uh, Jared Isaac Man has done his extravehicular activity, so we're probably going to move on to Sorry, Gillis now. Um, who's a SpaceX engineer. Who is a SpaceX engineer. And uh, there again, you know, you say non-professional astronaut. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I she, she works for SpaceX. If you really look at the, the situation, well, that means we you, have... You yourself we could do this uh, if you do the two years of training. Well, like, It'd be, would you maybe. love to? <laughs> no, well, it's, uh, you know, it's always the same... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously, it must be incredible to be up there and to have the opportunity to experience uh, weightlessness and obviously seeing your own planet from such a distance. It must be quite amazing. And also we are seeing, as we mentioned earlier, we are seeing in recent years that this concept of, of space tourism, which uh, five, ten years ago was, was not even uh, on the table. And as you mentioned, it was because of... Uh, moves made by previous U.S. administrations that we're seeing uh, space travel uh, at the, the levels we are today. Well, if you are, what's interesting is to realize that for now, space travel is not a profitable business. Obviously, space be rich. is. Hmm. But I'm talking about manned missions. They cost a lot of money. They're extremely complex. And, of course, one of the big questions marks is, right, you develop all this. You develop, for example, the Starship when it comes to SpaceX. For now, a lot of this is financed, in fact, by governments because simply it costs a fortune to send rockets into space, uh, you have to have, you know, for example, you we're talking about SpaceX. SpaceX cannot, at this stage, operate independently from NASA because they need the budgets. If tomorrow you start finding, for example, we know that on the moon uh, there is, you know, a lot of rare earth uh, that can be used to make phones, etc., etc. And the Chinese have estimated, you know, they've sent a, a, um, a, a probe uh, to the moon. They estimate that there is enough you know, rare earths uh, in, to produce what humanity may need for the next 10,000 years. So that, of course, for example, could make it very profitable to send rockets who could ferry this, you know, important uh, ore back uh, to our planet. Uh, there's also helium-3. We don't know what to do with it for now, but it is there. There's also water. And you don't know what you'll find on other planets or satellites, for example. It looks like Sarah Gillis is about to uh, get yes. out of... Uh, that uh, capsule. And James, final question for you. What is um, Elon Musk's ultimate goal when it comes to, to space? Is it to go to Mars? Is it to go to the moon? What, what's his ultimate goal? Well, I think it's all, you know, the, the, Elon Musk has said that he believes that uh, no species can uh, survive eternally if it is a monoplanet species. So this is I think it's very much uh, a philosophical quest to be a multi-planet species, as he put it a couple of times, uh, as in the colonizing another country. As you know, there's two visions when it comes to the future of humanity. There's those who believe that we need to stay on Earth and reduce fix our consumption, yeah, exactly. fix the planet, and, and you know, uh, manage to use less resources so that we can share the planet. Others believe that we can colonize other planets, and this is what Elon Musk quite clearly believes. So his ultimate goal, and this is probably why SpaceX is so efficient, uh, it has one goal, if you will, and that is sending human beings to Mars. And this is what they're trying to do at this stage. And this is one step towards towards that. But uh, quite clearly, yeah, that was that, that is his ambition. Fantastic stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, James Andre there.